Right, so, yeah, hi, I'm Phil, Phil Holmes, uh, I work at West Yorkshire Police, and I've worked there for 24 years, so a lot of the things I do now were invented when I started working at West Yorkshire Police, um, and there's my Twitter handle there. I won't have time for questions, but if anybody wants to ask me anything later, do feel free to get in touch. Um, sorry, double tap. So, I've got a uh, couple of things that I wanted to show you. First one's what I call multi-line edit. And the reason I thought I'd show you this is because somebody came into work and did this, and I thought, oh, yeah, I've never seen that before. And then I was on a conference call with somebody from another firm, and I showed them, and they went, oh, yeah, I've never seen that before. So I thought, I'll show you in case you've not seen it either. So the idea is that we can put a cursor on the beginning of, or in place on all the lines that we want to do, and make the same edit on all those lines. So, the other thing that I've learned from many attending sessions at SQL Bits is never demo live. So, I've made a video of it, and I hope that's going to work better. So, this is my video. So, the idea is, if we were imagining that we wanted to put an alias on this column as C, we can drop a cursor down by placing the cursor at the top, holding the Alt key and dragging the mouse down, so that we end up with a cursor on every line, and we drag it down, and we can then type, and as we type, the same type goes on every line. I thought that was bloody amazing, because nobody had ever shown me that before. So I'll whiz through again, put a cursor column name in, cursor at the top, hold the Alt key down, drag it down to the rows that we want to include, and we type. And what we type comes on the screen in every line, and it's amazing. It saves so much time. So moving on from that, very similar sort of thing um, is what I call the block select. I don't know if it's got a proper name, but I call it a block select. So it's a similar sort of thing. We can select a section of code in a block, not lines wrapped round, but just the block of code, and then repaste that somewhere else. Um, and the idea for this one as a demonstration was um, if we want to put on some nice user-friendly names on some columns. Um, so I've got this block. of You can see um, all the names are joined together, no spaces. So I can collect at that block of text by holding the up key down, dragging across all the columns, and then I can move across and, again, put my cursor on all the columns so that I can type in as dot. I paste in the block of text and it blocks it all in. I can then go in very quickly, edit, put the spaces in, and it gives nice friendly column names um, for you to see oh, that's far quicker than having to retype them all anyway so just go through it again nice and easily I hope maybe yeah so cursor at the top we holding the alt key drag and drag across so that we select that whole block of text then got the top column space across to where we want to be hold the alt key down again drag the mouse down to the bottom of the selection of text, type in the as for each line, and then press the control V to paste that block of text in. So you can imagine doing those types of things for many other functions. Um, a quick and dirty um, truncate all the tables in your database, select name from sys.tables, drag the paste, collect the results, drop them onto your um, command window and type in truncate table on the beginning of every line. It's one quick go, hit the button, quick and dirty, but it does the job um, if you need to do that. So I think the time is just about up, but I can't read with that. Oh, my God, 50 seconds. Um, the, well, I've got on the next slide then, quickly show you. Um, if you haven't seen this function, find it. But you can turn your scroll bar on the right hand side into a, a map window. It's in the options key, uh, options on SQL Server Management Studio. Um, I haven't got time to show you it all in action because I've missed five minutes, will run out. But it's, it's really useful for being able to jump around in a large chunk of text, um, a, a large piece of code, easily see within that map function on the, scale, on the side the uh, errors. 
And I think that's my time up. Yes, so, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I told you it was going to be tough. Don't you? <laughs> okay. So next we've got Rickon. Right. Ah, uh, so close enough. Uh, Without any audio. Billy. Sorry. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> right. So how to scale? Or not to hyper scale? That's the question. I can't hear myself, but I don't know if audio is good already. Panic! <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, it's good. All right then. When you're ready? I'm ready. All right. All right, today I'm going to talk uh, uh, quickly about uh, hype scale. Uh, I've got a few talking points I want to um, uh, 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 touch today. Um, because it's only five minutes, I'm going to touch on a few things uh, uh, real, real short. Um, this, is, this is my contact information. If you have any questions or want to uh, hit me up with any uh, follow-up questions, um, these are in the slide deck as well. They will be available after uh, the conference. Um, first up, the uh, general design of hyperscale. Um, when you're looking at all the Azure SQL databases, um, the most thing you can, uh, the, the best thing you can change is V cores. You can add V cores, you can uh, remove V cores, and when you're doing that, it's got all kinds of implications with uh, more or less memory, uh, log I/O, uh, what you're getting, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, for hyperscale, there's a little design difference because it's, uh, it's got a number of um, RP back servers at the uh, at the back end. And you need to remember those because I'm going to co come back to those. Um, the one part that makes uh, hyperscale extra fast is that the log service is a separate service. If you're running a regular database, um, all databases are in full recovery mode. So your log files will get hit hard, especially when you're doing a lot of transactions uh, like we do with our, with our ETL processes. And um, in the uh, hyperscale part, uh, it's, it's a bit of separate uh, service, and in our uh, proof of concept, we found that it uh, added a lot to the performance by running a uh, hype scale. Um, well, of course, as memory, um, we never ran into uh, resource semaphores issues, so there should be enough memory. When I checked, the server we were on had about 450 gigabytes of memory available. Um, and depending on the number of cores you've got, uh, you'll get more or less memory from that. It starts about 32 gigabytes and then it's going up. And when we were um, running our project, first thing, um, when we went to, to, to the hyperscale, we found that we lost most to all of our log-related weights just by going to hyperscale because it's a separate service. And that was quite awesome. Um, the other thing we could do, we could scale by query. So we can add uh, uh, an extra statement into our query to scale up or scale down. So if we've got an intensive query, we can add cores, and when we, uh, we've got an easy one that's running on one or two cores, we can scale down again to uh, minimize cost. But when you're going to scale, effectively you're doing a failover. And you have to make sure your application can handle a failover. Ours couldn't and broke. So I had to add some stuff to make sure it, uh, it stayed alive. That was, that was cool. Um, within a failover, some or more or, uh, of your DMVs will lose their contents. The one I was really um, 
uh, I really disliked that I was losing its content. But the, the, the index used its statistics. They got reset to zero. And that was awful because I wanted to know if indexes were used or not. Um, and you've got to look at your restores. Because when you're doing a restore, uh, the, the, the backups are snapshots. I mean, you're doing a restore, you're getting the settings from, the, from your snapshot. And when you're going to restore a table, a small one, you don't want this setting, unless you want to sponsor Microsoft. So please check your settings. Now, we had a, hit a little hyperscale bug. And the one thing I want you to take away from this is do not upgrade your database to hyperscale. Because the underlying design might break. You're supposed to get a 128 gigabyte uh, page server. We got a one terabyte one. And that didn't perform at all. We found it out because this weight, RBO, RG storage weight, came up a lot. And you're not supposed to get that one. We had it. They kill our performance. Now, you want to check uh, uh, your files, and usually you do it with SSMS to check uh, in, in general files, but you can't. What you need to do is run this query to find out the number of uh, uh, um, pages you've got, and when you divide them by the right number, you get uh, the size of uh, uh, file size in gigabytes. This is what you want to see. You want to see the name of your database, and 128 gigabytes, and at the lower end, you want to see less and less and less, so it's dividing the data over more page servers. This is what you want to see. Now, I've been flying through my session, but I wonder how many of you will be using Hyperscale? One, two, doubts. <laughs> okay. If you have any questions, you can hit me up in the hallway or online. And thank you so much for joining my session. Was it the F2 to you? <laughs> Was it F5? Ah. Okay, so we're going to do like the session. There's no handheld mic, so the people on, you know, remotely, they can see everything from the knees and the dance. So who attended? You ready? I'm ready. Yeah. Oh. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so before you start counting down, or you can, or you can start counting down it. I just discovered something. This is not part of my session, but I discovered something amazing. I think I found a really good business opportunity. I was in the Power BI uh, Power Hour, and they were throwing things at the audience. And somebody in front of me had a cold cup of coffee, and some T-shirt hit the cup of coffee, and I got sprayed with coffee. I was soaking; it was dripping off my skin, and. I've noticed I smell like coffee now. I'm getting looks from the audience. This is a really good thing for a geek uh, thing. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? yeah <laughs> so <laughs> my partner is in the high high um, high end skincare. I think I'm going to run this idea by her because I'm getting the ooh la la so, but, uh, from uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, really, it's an idea. A geek conference smell like coffee. It seems to work really well. Um, all right, you want to do a countdown, or did you already start? I st okay. Um, so my name is Andre. I'm a I'm a Dutchie, and that's me. I've been in IT for ooh, since 1989, hence the gray hair, and um, I I am in, in in BI stuff mostly. I'm an original originally a SQL Server person. And I advise a lot of developers on how to use SQL Server. I do some uh, some uh, BI stuff, uh, in the Power BI stuff, active da uh, Azure Data Factory, and 
I get a lot of, lots of questions from my colleagues on how does this work, how does that work, so I need to keep up with everything that's new and I have to advise people. And I'm here to talk about how do you, how do you not know everything better than others, but how do you know enough so you, you can advise people on where to go, because you can never know everything that doesn't work like that, right? So here's a few tips that I have that I've learned in the years on how to uh, keep on learning, but without doing that in the middle of the night, because we all have a day job and then we have to learn. And how do, how do you do that without trying to learn everything, right? Because that just doesn't work. There's too much, especially since now this cloud stuff. You, it used to be easy, right? SQL Server, just r learn all the new uh, features every year and a half or two years. Uh, but now in, in the cloud, every two weeks something happens, right? So. Watch the news. What do I mean with that? Um, what I mean is I use, for instance, I skim. I skim a lot. I use a service called Feedly. And in Feedly, I have all the blog bloggers that I follow. And Feedly just gives me a daily overview of everybody that posts a new blog post. I get the line of, I get the title, and I just skim through the titles. If I forget it for a week, this can go up to a 1,000. So I don't read everything. I just skim through. I go, okay, that's interesting. Right click, uh, tab. That one is interesting. Right click, tab. And sometimes I just know enough by reading the title. Ah, that's good to know that this exists. This is a documentation about a new feature or something. I know that the feature exists. I don't have to learn about the feature, everything right now. I'll just know that it exists and I move on. I don't read everything. That's but this works for me, skimming through the, I, I follow a lot of blogs, uh, but I don't read all of them. But I, I do have it in the back of my head, wait a minute, somebody blogged about that. I saw that scrolling past the other day, so I, I keep an eye on that. Uh, this is also one that <laughs> is a good example. Uh, so there's a lot of um, features right now that post monthly updates. Um, Data Factory does that. Um, uh, data Factory does that, the Data Bricks does that, and there's a lot more. And so you could do once a month, you just go to the update page on the website and read through. What you can also do is just watch a YouTube video of somebody who's the, who does that and skims through it even quicker, right? And again, I don't have to try all these features or know everything about these features. Some of them, I just it's good that I know that it exists and how it approximately works so I can fit it into, in, so my mind can fit into it into an architectural thing, right? Um, so that's one th tip. Um, watch the news. Where are oh, here's another one that I use a lot. Um, automate a lot. I've, I've done a lot of, th especially when I worked in on-prem situations, when you want to try something, but then you need, oh yeah, I need a VM with an Active Directory and I need two SQL servers that need to be in a cluster before I can try this one feature to see if that works. Um, if you use a lot of automation, there's a lot of tools out there, like Automated Labs is a Power BI library that will do this, what I just said, like Active Directory, two SQL servers in a cluster, with one line of code in about 15 minutes. You click on it, you wait 15 minutes, you get some coffee, uh, drink it, don't rub yourself in it. That was a bad idea. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and you have your lab setups. Uh, also Terraform, DBA tools, those are perfect tools to quickly generate a test environment and try something out uh, without spending too much time. How am I doing on time? 30 seconds left? I'm going, oh wow, you started so soon. All right. Um, I'm going to go over time here. <laughs> oh, I'm not. So produce, don't consume. This works really well if you um, want to learn something better. Start making something. Um, I did some Power BI stuff, but also something in, uh, in uh, open source that works really well. Find out what gives you energy. So something that just takes energy and doesn't give anything back is a bad thing to invest your time in. If con conferences really work for you, Go to those. If, if they eat your time, don't do that. This is, but this is the one Im last important one. I need the time for this. This is one last tip that I have for you to squeeze the most out of your day when you're already tired and you have not really much energy left, but you still want to learn something. Oh. 
Don't do that. Really don't. Uh, take a step back. Relax. Um, burning down is a real thing. Don't try to learn and learn and learn and learn. If you're tired and, you're, and you don't want to anymore, then stop. Don't do it. Listen to some music. I am biased. Uh, listen to a Dutch author, a Dutch musician. Um, this is Alex van Halen. Um, or this is, uh, um, this is not, this, uh, that's his brother, I have 10 seconds. This is Edward van Halen, or as you know him as Eddie van Halen. Uh, listen to van Halen, because that's really good music to uh, relax by. <laughs> and one last tip is homework. Here's homework that you need to do. Watch Katharina Wilhelmsen's uh, keynote on... What are you <laughs> You're cheering. You're cheering with me, right? This is because this is a good idea. I'm, I'm serious, people. Uh, don't, don't overdo it. Don't try to learn and learn and learn until you're tired and can't learn anymore. Watch Katarina's keynote on how to keep up, how to um, uh, reload yourself. I'm, you're just going to have to kick me off the stage here. I'm going to Come on. Come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Come on. All right, that's it. Thank you. Um, yeah. 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 You coming through really loud. The rest of the room. Andre back. Yeah. I literally said, look, it's on the laptop. It's not it. You over there. I can see you. Do you want Andre back? Yeah, okay, right. For you. Alright. Cool. Give me a sec. I mean, obviously, all my authority is gone in the room. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you've got that time. Currently, 10, 15 minutes. every conference has an Andre, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. No, well done, Andre. It was brilliant. Whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. 100%. So, SQL Server, or Transact SQL as we know it, is not a traditional coding language. Essentially, you don't give it a given set of instructions and it doesn't execute them in a certain, in a certain way or a certain uh, order. So what SQL Server is, or Transact SQL, work, is a declarative language. We tell SQL what we want, we declare what we need, we tell it where to get it from, but we don't necessarily tell it how we want that um, information given to us. What we're talking about today is SQL order of executions. It's also sometimes referred to as SQL order of operations. I don't like that term because it comes very close to operators, um, and order of operators, operator precedence, is actually talking about your, uh, your mathematical and your logic functions, and um, it's something completely different. So let's speak about order execution. It is also referred to as logical query processing. This term was coined by Itzik ben Gan, and if this is something that interests you, I strongly recommend go check out Itzik's web posts um, on logical query processing. Brilliant. Really explains it nicely. I can't do this justice in five minutes. I'm going to try that. I'm going to leave you with this mindset, though. It's like a recipe. So we're going to buy a whole bunch of ingredients. We know what our end result is. I want a cake. But SQL Server is going to be the chef. SQL Server knows the order in which to take the various um, ingredients and put them together. Um, and it's very much like if you were trying to make a cake, if you cracked your eggs before you sifted your flour, you'd land up with something that wouldn't necessarily be a cake, though. Okay, so we're going to run through a quick example so you guys understand this. Um, and really, yes, we don't have control over this. So is it important to know? Yes, because you can start writing queries knowing what SQL Server is going to do under the hood. So the first thing I've got is I've got a speaker's table. You'll see there's a speaker ID and a speaker desk. I've populated some information into it. I've also got a talks table. So we've got a talk desk, I've got a speaker ID, and I've got the length of talk in minutes. Also populated, my common key is going to be my speaker ID. All right, so... 
Uh, we've been asked to uh, run a quick report by the SQL Bits organizers, so you'll see there's a quick, uh, quick and dirty SQL script. I'm not going to go through it. Not really important, but it does work, I can guarantee you, but we're going to look at what is the order that SQL, or, uh, SQL Engine is now going to um, execute these in. So the first thing that SQL Server is going to do is it's got to get the data from the tables. So the first part it looks at is your from predicate. If there's only one table in your from, SQL Server knows automatically that the input of this is the output that it's going to use for, the, for its sort of subtable. If there's more than one uh, table in your from query, which by the way is a really bad habit, please always use explicit joining. Or if there's a join query, SQL Server is then going to form a Cartesian result out of that. Okay, so that's, sorry, number of tables in your from, and then your Cartesian product, which is your result, which is mashing the two tables together. The next thing that SQL Server is going to do if there is a join is it's going to actually look on your on predicate and it's going to do the matches. It's going to identify the matches. It's going to reduce the results of that Cartesian table. The last thing that SQL Server is going to do is it's going to actually join on those outer rows if you've got an outer join. In this case, we're not using an outer join, so there won't be any ad outer rows added. So here's my Cartesian product. I couldn't put them all on the screen, but there are 45 records, which is my 9 times 5 from my two tables. Great. Okay, next thing it's going to do is it's going to identify the matches. So what it's done now is it's reduced it down to just my nine results over there. It's still a Cartesian product. It's just slightly filtered down. Then the second thing that's going to happen is a row filter. This is looking at our where predicate. So what it's going to do is it's going to use conditional expressions on every single row. Where the conditional expression doesn't match in a true, it's going to drop those records from the result. So you'll see what's happened here is any records that had a speaker name of James have now been dropped from the record. My group by clause forms my grouping section of uh, the third part of the SQL Server order of execution. And you'll see what happens here is it takes all of those rows, it groups them to sets by the group by clause. Um, it, then evalu uh, it then presents those sets back to you. What you'll also see here is it's a distinct result. Okay? And for this reason, I always recommend when you're looking for distinct results, get your grouping by right. Don't try to force it with a distinct, um, with a distinct um, query. Last part of, sorry, not the last part, but the last part of the grouping is my group filter. So it's your having clause. So think about having as a filter on your groups. SQL Server is no longer, once you've got a group, our SQL Server is no longer going to look at individual rows. It's going to look at sets of rows or a result set. And in this case, what we're doing is we're filtering down. So we're saying where my talk description is, uh, where I've got more than one talk, or, sorry, two or more talk descriptions. And you'll see that now I've only filtered down. I've only got two speakers left. Then what SQL Server is going to do is it's going to do my return expression. It's going to look at my select statement. In this, it's basically deciding what am I going to print out as a result set for you, and also what, fu what functions is it going to apply in any of those columns there. What you'll see here is we've got the, two fun uh, we've got the, the aggregate functions, and you'll also see that I've aliased them to give my columns meaningful names. And please always, as a good scripting habit, do that. So you'll see this is basically the sort of end results of my, um, my query, but there is one more thing, and that is my paging. Um, and my order by. And you'll see here what it's going to do is it's going to go through it, um, it's going to look at it, it's going to give me the presentation of my result set, um, and in this case it just ordered it by. If there's a limit, it's also going to limit the result set size. Running out of time. How many seconds have we got left? You've got about minus 30. Okay, cool. All right, well, we're done. All right, so let's wrap up here and let's look at how the order actually, the order of the query ran. And this is a nice way to do it because you're going to see the entire query and you're going to see how we've broken it down. So number one is my get data, okay? That's split into three parts. So the first part, it looks at the from and the join. The second part of that, it looks at the on predicate. I'll go slower if you want. No, no, no. Okay, we're almost done. We've got another presenter who needs to present. Okay, so we're almost done, Larry. No, 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 unfortunately. Okay, guys. If Andre runs out of time, let's... Thank you, Warren. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I'll just drop there. Time? Yeah, thanks. You got one more side? Okay.
Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Well, then I'm going to start because then he hasn't done the time yet, so I get my extra seconds. I'm Laura GB. Um, I'm active on Twitter. You can find me as Laura GB. I have a YouTube channel and a blog called Hatful of Data. Yes, I like Terry Pratchett's Sky Full of Data. No, Hatful of Sky. Something like that. So, our first presenter said, never do anything live. Last year, I had a client who I made them a whole lot of paginated reports because that's what they needed because they wanted to print it um, and it was horrible. So I, so I foolishly over Christmas did 12 days of paginated reports. My husband didn't like it because um, I was always doing reports, these the, the little videos. Um, and it's to walk you through paginated reports. So I'm doing day two. Day one was create this template. Not quite that template, but that'll do. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a paginated report in four and a half minutes. Um, so the first thing you need to do inside inside a paginated report, okay, and they're aimed for printing, okay. This is when your Power BI person, when you do that beautiful Power BI report, you spend hours on it, and the management say that dreaded phrase, can I print it? The answer is no, unless you give me a premium per user thingy, or, or premium capacity, and I get to do paginated reports. So, the first thing we need to do is we need to add a data source, okay? There are limited data sources that we can use. So, for this one, we're going to use a SQL Server database, okay? And let's give it a name. Let's give it a name. Actually, we're not going to type many things on this screen because I can't see the keyboard. Um, we're going to then click Build. And it's going to ask me my server name. There's a really good Windows shortcut, by the way. It's um, Windows V. It saves up your uh, your keyboard, your saves to um, the clipboard. And my authentication, I'm going to use SQL Server just because it's easy. Um, and I've got it set up. And I'm going to see if I can remember the password. If not, it was on my thing. Um, if anybody saw it, it's okay. It's going to change. I think I've just typed the wrong number. Let's see if that works. Test my connection. Yay! Um, and it's important to do the test connection because then this drop down works. Okay, and I've got a database there called SQL Bits. Really should tidy up my databases, but never mind. Let's click OK. And so that's given me the connection string, and then I can click OK. For those of you that are used to writing connection strings, you could have done it and worked it out by yourself, but I don't do those things, especially when I haven't got my glasses. So I've got a data set, I've got a data source there. I now need to create a data set. So we're going to do a right click on there, and we're going to add a data set. Okay, I'm going to call this Races Data. And my data source is going to be the races. Now, for those of you that write SQL, I'm assuming by the previous sessions, most of you do. I do, but hey, we're going to cheat. And we're going to go to Query Designer. You probably can write better, better things. The first few times you come in here, it asks you to type this in multiple times. Um, I'm not going to trust me typing twice. Um, and there we are, we get into a window here. Now inside my window here, um, I'm going to do, uh, if you didn't go to the Roche's Maxim 20 minute talk earlier today, put the transformations as high upstream as you possibly can. Buy your DBA cookies is my version because then they'll write the views for you. Um, so I've got a whole bunch of tables, but I'm going to go actually for a view. In this case, I'm my own my own DBA, but hey, it's a small database, I can cope. So I've got my three columns, I just ticked a box. I could have expanded and picked which columns I wanted. Okay, and then we're going to click OK. And there we are, it wrote some really simple SQL. I, I don't want to know if it's good or SQL or bad SQL, okay. Um, and then we're going to click OK. I've got 30 seconds. So then we're going to do, right, this is going to be really racing it, isn't it? So then we're going to insert, we're going to insert a table. We're going to insert a table there, and we're going to click, 
and I'm going to drag in the columns, and we're going to go like that, and we're going to go like that, and we're going to go like that, okay? I'm not even going to do a preview of it. We're going to go publish, and we're just going to assume it works, okay? Um, and the, the, the internet thing is here. Look, I've even created a data set. You have to be a premium or premium per user, and let's just call it panic, because that's what we're doing. And then we go publish. Time stops, by the way, while the internet's not working. And then we come into here, and we're going to do a refresh. That was the wrong thing to do, because it was there. And then we're going to go, and I've got seconds. I know you can't out these fingers on the Yeah, I'm going to say, you're showing them to everybody else. It could not connect to data. So we're going to fix that very, very quickly because I've forgotten the bit you've got to do and, and, and you're going to let me do this because, hey, you, you, you love me or something. <laughs> and you let everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so there's a thing called manage because, hey, Microsoft couldn't call it the same thing for credentials. So for paginated reports, you need to come in here and do your data source credentials, edit credentials, and let's just click sign in. Except that password looks way too long. That password does look too long. So what we're going to do is we're going to do that. I've changed the password. That's a stupid thing. Don't change passwords before a demo. Update. And then we're going to go back. I thought I was going to get it in time. And there we are. This is what I said I was going to do in the session. I was going to do in five minutes. Apologies, it took slightly longer. There you go. We've got a report online. So, does it does it work? It works. All right, I, I'm gonna. No, I'm not gonna talk for nine minutes. Um, so I have two things. First of all, creating a lightning talk is really hard because making a point in five minutes uh, and getting booed off the stage if you d if you go over is is not cool. Uh, so. Um, I'm sorry for making uh, for going over time. So Warren, that you 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 weren't even allowed to finish yours, man. That, that, sorry, man. Uh, can, can we get an applause for Warren, please? We. <laughs> 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 there is a reason. The reason is last five minutes, and if you go over the five minutes, you're eating into the other presenter's time. So it is a bit light and free, and I try and 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 I. I broke that rule and you were the victim of it, so sorry, man. Um, you, you went on the stage, you said, every conference has an Andre. I'm thinking, oh, that's not, oh, wait, that's not a compliment at all. <laughs> anyway, um, I've got two tips and then we'll, we'll, we'll let everybody go, right? Um, no slides, obviously. Um, two tips that I have. If you have a colleague that uh, refuses to lock their workstation um, and you're in, a, for instance, a bank and it's frowned upon to leave your workstation unlocked, uh, you've seen these queries where statements are separated by the word go. Uh, that's actually not a T-SQL thing. That's a management studio thing. And um, BCP has it or something, or SQL Command has it as well, the old one. 
Uh, so you can go into the settings of Management Studio and change it. So if you have a colleague that didn't lock their workstation, you can change the word go as the, se the batch separator in the settings of Management Studio and change it to, for instance, select. Uh, that will break everything they try to do from then on. And it will be really impossible to find because the error message says anything except for your colleague just changed the batch, batch separator. Uh, tip number two. If you have developers that write select star in all their queries, screwing up your non-clustered index access, because it always has to go to the clustered index, um, if they have a pipeline and it goes through test phases, what you can do in the first phase of the pipeline is inject a computed column on all your tables that divides by zero. Uh, that will also break every query that does a select star instead of naming the columns. Yes. <laughs> I've actually done that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that, that, so. Um, yeah, go. If we're now going for things to do to people if they don't lock their screens. I don't need a mic. I do need a mic. There's supposed to be somebody online. Um, you know, I'll like. Just hold it. Yeah, that works better, doesn't it? Um, so what you do is, if they're an Excel user, okay, you go into that Excel workbook that they use all the time, and you go into VBA and you add it, and you go and put in the on the um, close event, you put um, cancel equals true, and they can't close that workbook. Just saying. Anybody else got a great tip? Yeah, well, uh, we'll make this one the last one, and then everyone gets five extra minutes to have more coffee. Sounds good. Uh, so, similar thing, but this time we'll go to Word, and on Word, go into the uh, dictionary option and change the autocorrect for a word like and to I left my workstation unlocked. <laughs> that was one that actually one of the uh, Many, many years ago, one of the data people in our place used to do. If she found a workstation or not, she'd do that. So it's always good fun. <laughs>